Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Danielle Robinson. I'm the current director of CIRLAC, the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean. I'd like to extend a very special welcome to our invited guest this evening. We're excited and honored to be bringing such globally recognized thinkers into conversation. Vereen Shepard, who with Professor Hilary Beckles in Jamaica, has been at the forefront of research that has propelled the campaign for reparations for enslavement and whose prolific output has laid the issue squarely before the public attention. Natasha Lightfoot of Columbia University, whose award-winning work has paid particular attention to the understudied history of the Eastern Caribbean and whose current research focuses on emancipation studies and everyday forms of freedom. And Sakaya Thomas of the Global African Congress has been a tireless organizer and advocate for reparations in diaspora and more broadly. And so we're delighted to be able to join town and gown to cite our beloved David Trotman in tonight's discussion. If you allow me, I would like to give a little shout out to some of our people. Um, two of our fellows uh, have engaged in tireless work on our campus and have launched an anti-Black racism policy and action plan. And we're extremely proud of that, Carl James and Andrea Davis. We appreciate so much the important work that you're doing on all of our behalf. Uh, quick reminder, Part two of this conversation is gonna continue in about two weeks. You don't wanna miss it, March 31st at 5 p.m. The details will follow at the end of our uh, conversation tonight. And just a quick set of house rules. If we have a tech disaster, don't worry. We might get bumped out, but use the same link to come right back in. Everything will be fine. And if we happen to get trolled or bombed or whatever things these kids are thinking up these days, um, we'll take care of it as fast as possible, and then we'll just keep going. And finally, the chat, the system that we have is going to go directly into where the panelists and chair are, um, as opposed to the wider group. And uh, the chair and the panelists will decide which questions and comments they're going to engage with. And that's it. That's all for the house rules. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Danielle. I just want to reiterate a welcome to everybody um, and to say that this, these two panels, these two panels on reparation are part of a process of rethinking Caribbean studies at York and rethinking Caribbean studies more broadly in relation to the present moment and in relation to the new and old struggles that inform the region and its diaspora. We're involved in reflecting on how Caribbean studies might be meaningful in relation to articulations of Black life in the present. And we're also thinking about the ways in which the Caribbean remains a site in which the potential for radical politics of equality and difference exist in dynamic tension a context in which people who speak multiple languages, in which Asians, Africans, indigenous people, people from the Middle East, as well as a small minority of Europeans daily confront the meaning of reinventing the legacies of colonialism. So we situate the reparation series in these kinds of dialogues. The reparation struggle, the struggle for reparations, represents one of the most vibrant social movements in the Anglophone Caribbean at the moment, and it is linked into other reparative struggles and strategies for reparation around the world. We hope that through this labor, we will be able to expand our freedom dreams and further the unfinished project of emancipation, as Erna Broadbuck calls it. To think about freedom dreams is impossible without considerations of indigenous people and their struggles to hold on to land and identity. We who live on the ground here in Canada and stand here on this earth recognize that any discussion of decolonization and repair requires confronting the colonial history of Canada. So while there's much work to be done on this question, we honor the meaning of this work 
with a brief land acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement which is meaningless unless we recognize that it calls on us all to do more work to find out what exactly our obligations and responsibilities are to the people of this land, to a land where the treaties have been broken or dishonored. So I will proceed with the land acknowledgement with that caution in mind. York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which this university is located. And these relationships long precede the establishment of York. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territories of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and it is now home to many First Nations, Inuits, Métis, and others. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. We acknowledge that this territory is subject of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'd like now to introduce Shamet Hepburn. It's my great pleasure to introduce Shamet because she is a new member of the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean. She's an assistant professor of social work with degrees from the University of Toronto. And her research focuses on racism and the aging minoritized migrants, aging minoritized migrants, with, and she pays particular attention to Caribbean transnational migration. Her approach integrates critical pedagogy and community-based research, and with that, I turn it over to Shemet, who's going to talk a little bit about the panel and kick off the proceedings. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ford Smith, for your introduction. And as Professor Ford Smith said, I'm Shemet Hepburn, and I'm a faculty member at the School of Social Work at York University. And I'm th thrilled to welcome you to the Michael Baptista Lecture, which is the annual public lecture of the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean, CIRLAC. The lecture was established by the Friends of Michael Baptista and the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, to recognize the areas central to his spirit and success, the importance of his Car Guyanese Caribbean roots, his dedication to and outstanding achievements at the RBC, and his unqualified drive and love of learning. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Serlac has had to modify the format of the public lecture, choosing to host a series of online forums. This uh, format has had positive outcomes in that it has enabled CIRLAC to reach an even wider audience through expanded online intellectual uh, dialogue between York and networks of scholars, students, and communities across the Caribbean, Latin, Latin America, and Canada. This year, the series broadly addresses the questions of how to envision social, political, economic, and cultural alternatives at this moment of extraordinary change. Today's panel is the third installment of the Baptista Forum series. It is also the first of a two-part series on reparations under the theme, the Caribbean case for reparations, remembrance, reclamation, and restorative futures. The panel, which features renowned scholars and activists in the reparations movement, focuses on the emergence of the campaign for rep reparations in the Anglophone Caribbean and asks a series of questions about the origins and achievements of the campaign and its implications for social and political alternatives nationally, regionally, and transnationally. In addition to the longstanding work of scholars and activists, discussions on the issue of reparations for native genocide and slavery were in initiated at the 34th regular meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM in July 2013 in Trinidad and Tobago to engage the United Kingdom and other former colonial European nations on the matter. The commission is mandated to establish the moral, ethical and legal case for the payment of reparations by the governments of all the former colonial powers in the relevant institutions of these countries 
to the nations and people of the Caribbean community for the crimes against humanity of native genocide, the transatlantic slave trade, and the racialized system of chattel slavery. We know that ideas for restitution are not new. The struggle for justice to repair the damage born of enslavement, theft, extraction, maltreatment, and debt peonage has been ongoing since the abolition of slavery. However, in the last 10 years, we have seen an intensification of efforts at repair, repair work, an activity that concerns us all. The Caribbean reparations movement has accomplished much in its advocacy for redress in the UK and the Caribbean. This forum joins indigenous and African diasporic communities in Canada and the global South into debates on reparations for African enslavement in the Americas. This conversation introduces the many dimensions of the reparations debate and asks a series of questions about reparations in relation to our broad theme of alternatives in this present moment. So today we'll explore uh, questions around what is the context in which the campaign for reparations emerged in the Caribbean and what are its implications for social change? What key factors have led to the successful outcomes for Caribbean, repar the Caribbean reparations movement? What might reparations for enslavement look like transnationally and in the hemisphere? African enslavement happened on Canadian soil, as did indigenous enslavement. The Canadian economy benefited from plantation slavery and from the flight of capital from the Caribbean post-slavery, as well as reparations paid to slave owners. How might Caribbean people in the diaspora, diaspora further the discussion of reparations here in Canada? And how might allies support the project in its many dimensions? How are reparations scholars and activists pursuing the forms of redress transnationally in our hemisphere? And what are the implications of reparations for indigenous people in the hemisphere? What, are, what partnerships can be created with Canadian, Caribbean and Latin American reparations scholars, organizations and activists? So these questions will be explored today as we set about galvanizing our efforts to build synergies and devise strategies in the struggle for reparatory justice. And as we prepare to engage with the esteemed presenters, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this evening's panel discussion, Professor Michelle Johnson. Professor Johnson is an award-winning author and editor of several scholarly books and has published extensively in scholarly journals. She has taught at the Department of History at York University for almost 19 years. And prior to that, she taught at the University of the West Indies, Mona. Professor Johnson has also served the York community in a variety of capacities, including as the coordinator of the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Program, as York's Affirmative Action Officer, and as the director of the Harriet Tubman Institute for Research on Africa and its diasporas. Recently, Professor Johnson was appointed to the position of Associate Dean students in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. Her research interests and publications reflect Jamaican cultural history and the histories of gender relations, race and racialization, labor, domestic slavery, domestic service, and of course, uh, reparatory justice. Professor Johnson, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hepburn. I nearly didn't recognize who you are talking about, but let us let us press on. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation this, this evening. And we are so pleased that you have, uh, our, so far uh, over 100 people have joined us to have this important conversation. I'd like to to introduce each panelist and to give each panelist an, a moment to reflect, to, to come to this topic in their own way. And I'm going to start off by asking Dr. Natasha Lightfoot to talk to us. So Dr. Lightfoot is an associate professor of history at Columbia University. Her research interests include slavery, and emancipation in the Caribbean and the African diaspora. Her 2015 book, Troubling Freedom, Antigua and the Aftermath of British Emancipation, focuses on black working class people's struggles and everyday forms of liberation in Antigua and Barbuda after slavery's end. We welcome 
Professor Natasha Lightfoot. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Uh, many thanks, especially to Honor Ford Smith and to Sirlak for um, the invitation to join this really exciting conversation. So um, I want to begin um, by invoking the well-worn take that I will probably raise more questions than answers, but I will start with the first prompt regarding what the context is in which the campaign for reparations emerged in the Caribbean and what are its implications for social change. So as Professor Hepburn mentioned, CARICOM heads of member states began their official reparations campaign in 2013. And according to the CARICOM website, they were inspired by the book, Britain's Black Debt by Hilary Beckles, who is the UB vice chancellor and now head of the CARICOM reparations commission. I see that move as formalizing a portion of efforts for reparative justice that were extant in the Caribbean and the wider Americas for some decades now, or in another sense, since the first enslaved Africans were ever manumitted in their lifetimes before state run abolition processes took place. I speak now just not as a historian of Caribbean slavery and freedom, but as just someone with common sense that anyone who survived the brutality of slavery and saw themselves they, and, and managed to understand themselves as free would see themselves as being owed by those who profited from their dispossession. I also would profit late, a posit later movements such as Rastafari in Jamaica, Black Power in Trinidad, or the Grenada Revolution as attempts at reparatory justice. So in a sense, what's happening now is centuries in the making. But we should also consider CARICOM's turn to reparations in the context of the 2000s. That's a really critical decade where at the very beginning in 2001, the UN Conference on Racism in Durban renewed attention to the slave trade's role in global anti-Blackness. Then fast forward to 2007, where there's the intersection of two events that reveal the urgency of Caribbean reparations, but also the uncertainty of their fulfillment. The first being the 200th anniversary of the UK slave trade's abolition, which wrought an overly celebratory set of events where Britain patted itself on the back for ending the slave trade that it started. As black people of the Commonwealth noted this irony, knowing that slavery in the empire still continued for roughly three decades afterward and that British anti-Blackness never ended. Images of Black British activist and filmmaker Toyin Agbetu, who protested at the 2007 commemoration service at Westminster Abbey, at which Agbetu was let out in handcuffs, brought the ever-present anti-Blackness of the UK to its sharpest relief. In addition, 2007 would commence a prolonged time of financial drought in the Caribbean that frankly has yet to end as a byproduct of the banking crisis, economic recession, and subsequent bailouts that took place in the US and Europe. That crisis brought forth renewed scrutiny in terms of financial law internationally and trade treaties, which had a direct negative effect on Caribbean banking and economic opportunity overall. The Caribbean as a site of offshore havens has always been seen as competitive with and suspicious to and requiring policing by the global North, despite the latter's own long-term and quite destructive deregulatory financial impulses. This familiar self-protection by the United States and Europe at the Caribbean's expense further unraveled the little stability to be found in the region's already fragile economies. Economists have noted, interestingly, that Canadian banks, however, had weathered 2007's crisis due to a more centralized and regulated banking structure that didn't allow small financial shops with questionable practices to whip up false returns as did Europe and the US. Again, none of the structural rigidity portended material security for black people in Canada, financially or otherwise. We'll return shortly to the subject of said stable Canadian banks in my remarks. In addition to this, watching the 2007 bailout um, after the financial implosion had to have invoked for some Caribbean thinkers the massive British bailout of the century prior from 1834 to 38 that involved 20 million pounds for the widespread seizure of quote private property that freeing enslaved people represented for the empire's wealthy whites and the four years of unpaid apprenticeship that followed after emancipation. 
the slavery bailout brought them millions in cash and millions more worth of uncompensated labor from black people as a way to quote, teach them how to be free as if enslaved people ever needed tutelage on how to live freely. All of which were immediate consequences of 1807 that went unremarked in the 2007 bicentennial celebrations. This heady confluence would push Caribbean publics to revive old questions of why the global North always has the money to save itself from a rainy day, but crumbs for the South on whose back said rainy day cash was derived. So the recent conversation around reparations with many voices like Dr. Beckles, Dr. Shepard, other academics, activists like Mr. Thomas, journalists, politicians, all of this work has clarified the historically coordinated structures within the slave trade and slavery. Both produced overlapping and overwhelming profits between governments, banks, insurance houses, individual traders and plantation owners and other longstanding industries and institutions like shipping, liquor manufacturers, churches or universities, for instance. This discourse has raised the culpability of all involved in these long-term crimes against black humanity, especially in the time since the formation of the CARICOM Commission, the conversation about reparations has shifted from the fringes to the center of political debates in the Caribbean and its diasporas with implications for shared understandings of many post-colonial problems like govern governance, the economy, environmental and climate vulnerabilities, and now the massive recovery efforts required to navigate a post-COVID world, if that can ever be a thing. Each new regional crisis joins the host of the many unaddressed others of the recent and long-term past in reviving interest in and heightening calls for reparatory justice. On the one hand, CARICOM's commission brings institutional heft to reparations and offers it unprecedented visibility in the region and around the Americas. Part of the success in increasing public acceptance of CARICOM's efforts is that unlike in many other former slave societies largely dominated by white politicians, all of the heads of state in the region are descendants of enslaved people or indentured people and thus bear personal and communal histories directly tied to the inequities and bloodshed wrought by European colonialism. Also, all of the CARICOM government heads manage small and developing states on shoestring budgets that are in need of cash infusions with no strings attached, unlike the usual high interest short-term loans that are impossible to pay, pay and bear restructuring demands that are impossible to undo. Swaying these governments to support reparations would not nearly take as much effort as what Canada or the US's federal government still require to acknowledge and repay the debt of slavery as a practice of long-term theft. On the flip side, the fact that CARICOM states seek to appeal to European governments, inclusive of states like Britain and France, whose officials downplay slavery's role in their present stature, to recognize and redistribute their unearned wealth adds quite a complication. Canada and the US hold their ill-gotten wealth mostly in house that they could share with people of African descent if they move to federalize reparations, but so far both have refused to. So these are distinct paths to the same end. White government's insistence on keeping the past in the past when it comes to theft against black people makes the task of gaining reparatory justice Herculean. Other non-governmental institutions have made unprecedented moves to acknowledge their tainted historical profits. Most recently and notably the University of Glasgow's 20 million partnership with UWE. Are these the start of a wave or one-off successes on a still uncertain journey toward justice? Furthermore, given the long distrust by Caribbean people of governments ripe with opacity and corruption, the formation of CARICOM Reparations Commission lends a suspiciously status dimension to what has been a grassroots reparations mission that predated and mainly built itself outside of the auspices of the state. An overwhelming majority of people born in or with heritage in the region, well before CARICOM reparations came into vogue, 
knew that colonialism and slavery violently extracted profits from the region's human and natural resources, which left black working people with less than scraps. And such plunder over centuries fostered a desperation and circumstances that led to a massive outmigration of Caribbean people over the 20th and 21st centuries to the UK, to Canada, to the US and elsewhere in the world that spawned many folks in the room like myself, born in diaspora, but always tied politically, culturally and ancestrally to our homes away from home, mine being Antigua. Some of the pre-existing reparations work has folded into CARICOM's efforts. Some others who believe in the fundamental validity of reparations remain uncertain that if successful, member states and government has, should be trusted to receive and distribute these resources. I suggest that we can examine what a future with reparations could look like that engages with and imagines repair even beyond the 10 point plan that CARICOM has delineated. Given that anti-blackness is foundational to all these former slave societies, to put the onus of proof onto black people to document their genealogy so as to receive a personal check may create more problems than it solves. CARICOM rightfully has a plan to address various areas of structural inequity with essential forms of structural repair that would expand what has been to date black people's routinely blocked access to resources needed to thrive in post-emancipation life. That plan is thoughtful and multifaceted, but still remains the start of what can be a broader vision of how reparations can forge equity in the Caribbean and its diasporas. In particular, the 10 point plan names European governments as the entities against which reparations are being claimed. But the US and Canada are two governments that benefited from the same system of enslaved labor, often in concert with European governments as well. Not to mention the prolonged time in which both places were just mere colonial outposts of the same British crown that managed the enterprise of slavery for all of the Anglophone Caribbean. Enslaved people, the commodities that they were forced to generate and the industry built to transport both around the Atlantic world were processes from which the US and Canada were never insulated. This was a circuitry of profit that sucked resources out of the Caribbean for centuries to the benefit of all Northern Atlantic states. The first black populations of numerical significance in Canada and the US arrived via the British slave trade and considerable portions now of Canada's but also the US's black immigrant populations come from the direct result of both governments, financial, military and other assertions of neo-colonial power in the Caribbean since the early 20th century. And again, governments are not the only guilty entities in this centuries long crime. Institutions in the global north reaped wealth after slavery based on its legacies of poverty, disfranchisement and dispossession. We can start with, as Peter Hudson has noted, the ubiquitous presence of Canadian banks like Scotiabank and Royal Bank in the Caribbean from the middle 19th century, financing the production and shipment of commodities between Canada and the region. By the 20th century, they functioned in his words, quote, as surrogates for US corporations where they acted as intermediaries in facilitating United States trade and commercial operations in the Caribbean and occasionally provided the financial machinery for US colonial governments, end quote. And this is all during a point where military expansions for both are taking shape in the region. Who all do they owe for this? If not half a hemisphere's worth of black people still fighting institutionalized anti-blackness in every walk of life how to account for reparatory justice among a people who are long mobile due to conditions far beyond their control, how to repair the lives of those who upon exiling themselves from their homelands to seek quote better in the global North meant subpar education, subpar housing, exploitative labor conditions and racial policing that all formed a modern reinforcement of the inhumanity of blackness and slavery that slavery and its afterlives had long established. This would put folks like me or my cousins in Mississauga in the complex position of deserving reparations, not only from Britain, but also the US and Canada, if we consider the historical trajectory of Caribbean folk most truthfully. There is no way to quantify a specific amount of cash or a distinct circle of debtors to rectify what has been these um, tattered lives of black people. 
we face so many intertwined forms of state and institutional violence that have continuously produced fungible black flesh as scholars like Tiffany Lathabo King and Saidiya Hartman have termed it over generations. If we think about a black feminist tradition of scholarship on the story of how race making has been marked on black people's body bodies. Here we might even engage too in a dialogue about debt as a concept and the fact that repair, repairing slavery may not ever be possible. Inverting how debt is structured to work within capitalism as unpayable so as to always keep people tied to wage labor. Is there a figure that can ever settle a justice that may still be denied even after reparations? An anti-Blackness that might still persist, probably will still persist even after the checks are cut. CARICOM via the, the Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley communicated this week, um, and I got this through the Antigua Reparations WhatsApp group, which I'm on, and hello to Dorbrina Mard, who I see in the, in, the, in the list of participants there. I saw that there was a memo circulated with the intent to create a development fund as an addendum to the 10 point plan where institutions beyond European governments can contribute to, um, to Caribbean development. And I think here CARICOM can expand, expand its claims beyond Europe to include Canadian and US governmental and private sector entities in light of this sordid history I only briefly glossed. Caribbean people might also see themselves as having common cause then to fight for reparations collectively with black Canadians and black Americans given the hemispheric overlaps and how the slave trade and slavery was structured and drew profits and the parallels in the multiple forms of institutionalized racism that each of these groups have faced since abolition. Such an alignment would reflect a pan-Africanist path to reparations that past activists like Queen Mother Audley Moore and present ones like the Global Active African Congress or Ron Daniels and the IBW have espoused as opposed to nation state centered approaches. CARICOM's plan also might concentrate on other social issues that deserve distinct forms of redress within the larger reparatory justice program. For instance, inequities around gender and sexuality. The system of slavery generated a devaluation of black women's bodies via legal hereditary enslavement and customary sexual violence by whites. As a result up to now, black women face violence in social relations and devaluation of their labor in the Caribbean and its diasporas from which there's unsurprisingly little state protection in the region and thus requires communities of women to organize and protect themselves instead. I raise here the work of organizations like Red for Gender in Guyana, Life and Leggings in Barbados, Femininity in Trinidad or Intersect in Antigua and Barbuda among others whose missions align with reparatory justice. I would also raise here queer um, sexualities and the violence that befalls queer people um, and the anxiety around this as being also tied to slavery and its repair. The criminalization of queer lives in the region began with the inheritance of European legal and religious principles that enforced the Protestant work ethic to harmful effect. So I would raise the work of Janiel Matthews and Tracy Robinson at the UEK Hill Law School to expose and eliminate current regional laws against so-called buggery and cross-dressing both of which are crimes that descend from statutes passed right after abolition around the Anglophone portion of the region against vagrancy. And vagrancy ultimately meant enforcing by law that black people in public white space must always prove themselves to be laboring for white profit and that they should live in monogamous heterosexual intimacies and nuclear family structures. An impossibility in 1834, which is something I write about, and even an impossibility now for Caribbean people. Also here I would raise incisive work by Elisa Trotz on the links between police brutality, state outlawing of homosexuality, sexual violence against men and women, and the politics of social respectability in Guyana. So there's scholarship here that, that push us to think about the layered forms of gender advocacy that can begin a much needed and more complicated reckoning around the ways that women and queer people bear rightful claims to repair not just from colonial, but even post-colonial Caribbean governments that uphold anti-Blackness, misogyny, and homophobia. I'm gonna end just by saying that CARICOM has made history by um, entering the reparations discourse 
and bringing some of the greatest exposure yet to the centuries long step against black people that's still in progress. Room to expand reparations work to even greater revolutionary potential by allowing for broader self-reflection on the many forms of social change that reparations can contain and having utmost accountability to the multiple publics that make up the Caribbean at present. So I'll stop there. Thank you guys for listening. I'm really excited to um, have a dialogue with the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Natasha. I think we're off to an amazing start. Thank you for, for that uh, intervention. I now introduce uh, Dr. Vereen Shepard, uh, author of seven books, who is a fellow of the Cambridge Commonwealth Society, honorary fellow of Jesus College, University of Cambridge, and Professor Emer Emerita at the University of the West Indies. Professor Shepard is currently director of the UWI's Center for Reparation Research, host of Talking History, a nationwide 90, 90FM Jamaica radio station program, and vice chair of the UN's Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Previously, she was a member and then chair of the UN's Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. I introduce to you Professor Vereen Shepherd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. Greetings in this UN International Decade for People of African Descent. And my thanks to Professor Honor Ford Smith for inviting me to participate in this forum. I greet the moderator, my former Mona History Department colleague, Professor Michelle Johnson, my fellow panelists, the discussant, who is a former visiting fellow in the Center for Reparation Research, Mr. Chevy Eugene, and members of my family there in Canada who have tuned in. I congratulate the organizers for conceptualizing the theme and raising the critical questions that must be posed as we think about what I refer to as the six R's that are the imperatives of the reparation movement. We must collectively remember, reclaim, restore and repair in order to secure rights and achieve reconciliation in this reparation century on behalf of the close to 5 million Africans forcefully relocated to the Caribbean, my example, who arrived alive up to 1811. And I want to stress 1811 because of the hypocrisy of a celebration every March 25, invoking the Abolition Act of March 25, 1807 because ships with Africans arrived in the Caribbean up to 1811 and even beyond. So I cannot address all the questions that were sent to, to the panelists in the time allowed to me, but I will address some of them and I guess the others can be dealt with in the Q&A session. And in any event, I think that my colleague uh, raised and covered quite a number of them. So first, what is the context in which the campaign for reparations emerged in the Caribbean? What are its implications for social change? The short answer lies in the definition of reparation, which is repair in agreed form or forms for wrong or wrongs done. Knowledge in the Caribbean of the wrongs done to, uh, through conquest, colonization, and continuing post-colonial harm have all fueled the emergent, emergence of this demand for repatriate justice. We can catalog some of them by summarizing the justification for the demand directed at the colonizers. We know European governments were owners and traders of enslaved Africans, that they instructed genocidal actions upon indigenous communities. They created the legal, financial, and fiscal policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans. They defined and enforced African enslavement and native genocide as in their national interest. 
They refused compensation to the enslaved with the ending of their enslavement. They imposed a further 100 or more years of racial apartheid upon the emancipated. And to date, they have refused to acknowledge such crimes or to engage in meaningful reparatory justice conversations with the descendants. I also wish to add the ways in which the liberators you see on the next two slides, both male activists and female activists were brutally punished for insisting on their right to live as free people. They were punished through rape, hanging, decapitation, deportation, endless floggings, imprisonment, just general inhuman treatment. Happily, we have intentionally found ways to honor many of them, including through sites of memory. As Sabine Marshall states, and I quote, a memorial constitutes a transnational transitional object that facilitates the process of mourning. Public commemoration, especially through lasting memorials of selected dead heroes, can be a strategic move to legitimate the emergence of a new sociopolitical order. Resistance is political, and so is memorialization. The inequity of compensation for enslavers alone, post-slavery injustices that would have given rise to, to the Morant Bay War, deceptive indentureship, and the failure of any equivalent of a Marshall or Colombo plan for newly independent nations as colonizing pause withdrew from the region are other reasons for the rise of the movement in the Caribbean. And based on the slide you're seeing now, which I call the big payout, planters in the big four countries, as you can see, pocketed about 50% of the compensation payout, borrowed from the Rothschild's bank, um, 15 million of it, and not paid off until 2015. So when we talk about this is too long ago in the past, and when we invoke the theory of distance to in fact distance ourselves from the reparation movement, we have to say it, it wasn't that long ago after all. As Eric Williams said in 1962 in London, uh, in a speech in which he expressed disgust that Britain had refused what he and others had requested as an independence financial plan to make up for the post-emancipation neglect, and I quote, the West Indies are in the position of an orange. The British have sucked it dry, and their sole concern today is that they should not slip and get damaged on the peel. The offer is quite unacceptable because Britain had offered a, a pittance compared to what the leaders of the Caribbean were arguing for to actualize their independence. So the offer is quite unacceptable, and we would prefer not to have it. It amounted, it amounted to aid to Britain rather than to Trinidad, speaking specifically of what Trinidad was offered. I do not propose to accept any concept of the Commonwealth, which means common wealth for Britain and common poverty for us. And I think this last part um, is what a lot of people were saying on March 8th when some people were celebrating Commonwealth Day uh, this year. I think most of us were ce celebrating International Women's Day anyway. I share Eric Williams' feeling of insult. Why am I outraged? Because all of this is personal to me. My Cameroonian ancestors on my mother's side were forcefully relocated to Jamaica. My great-great-grandfather, Alexander Mighty, was born into slavery in 1829. The British enslaver Hibbert got compensation of 6,338 pounds sterling for the 428 enslaved people who worked on a plantation called Hopewell in St. Mary, which later became a land settlement in which my father was able to buy a small piece of land. And Hibbert enslaved those who walked on that land before me. Kuba, Mimba, Sue, Delia, Wanika, Ben, Ned, James, Cyrus, and others who got nothing but freedom, important as freedom is. Unlike 
enslavers like Hibbert. 46,000 planters were rewarded for their criminal enrichment with compensation to the tune of 47 million if one includes a scam called the apprenticeship system. To date, there have been statements of regret, but no apology from Europeans for the harm they caused the region. Yet reparation has implications for social change. The demand is for a development package to address social infrastructural development and the impact of climate change, and of course, environmental degradation because of centuries of plantation construction. This is the ongoing work of reparation advocates and the Caribbean reparation movement formally initiated in 2013 when the CARICOM heads of government established a CARICOM reparations commission and mandated the heads of government and to establish national commissions for reparation in member states. And to date, there are at least uh, 10 of them in the region. As reparation has a long genealogy in the region, the CRC builds on the work of indigenous peoples who struggled against conquest and colonization and insisted on their human rights. Enslaved Africans who opposed chattel enslavement, the newly emancipated in all of the Americas who took up the struggle, protesting the attempts of colonizers to continue the relations of production of the previous era, indentured and post indentured Indians who protested their treatment by plantation owners. Marcus Garvey, Rastafari and labor rights activists in the 1920s and 30s, as they espoused Pan-Africanism, repatriation and workers' rights. Individual politicians long before the CARICOM Operation Commission, like Mike Henry, PJ Patterson and Ralph Gonzalez, and scholar activists and civil society partners. So what key factors have led to successful outcomes for the Caribbean reparation movement? This is one of the questions posed. For us, success is not really measured in terms of the settlement of, of the debt in financial terms, or even the establishment of the fund that we're talking about today. But in wider acceptance across all sectors of the rightness of the demand, it resides in the creation of a formalized joint CARICOM mandated commission for advocacy and activism regarding repatriate justice for the region with a prime ministerial subcommittee headed by Mia Motley. And there you can see some of the members, the initial members of the CRC and most of them are still in place. And you can see the regional structure uh, that I was talking about, just an overview there. Some, there's some evidence too of community reparation by UK individual families and institutions. And the, some of them have been approaching the Center for Reparation Research, which was established in 2017, because they are, I suppose, interpreting reparation as not only being the macro reparation of state to state, um, organization and negotiation, but small individual steps that they can take as people who have found papers of their families, found their connection to enslavement, found their connection to compensation and want to do something in the Caribbean. And some of that is going on right now. There is also, as I mentioned, the establishment of the center for reparation. And the increasing numbers of individuals and institutions across the world owning up to their wrongs and discussing amends. And I think we all know the universities in the United States of America, the universities in the UK, including Jesus College Cambridge, which has asked me to be their external member on their working party, looking into how Jesus College is connected to enslavement and also the larger Cambridge University is doing that. So what might reparation for enslavement look like transnationally and in the hemisphere? Well, I won't go over all the points already raised except to, to, to uh, show the, the 10 point action plan, which is still the strategy for repatriate justice in the region, even though we may add or expand particular points. 
So full formal apology, because as I said before, statements of regret do not constitute apology. An apology has three parts. The acknowledgement of wrong, the commitment to non-repetition, and the engagement in repair. We are lobbying for an Indigenous Peoples Development Program because of what happened to the, our Indigenous people. Repatriation for those who choose it, the building of cultural institutions, the attention to the public health crisis. And we can all see what is happening in this pandemic because of the, the, the weak public health um, institutions that we have in the region. And we are the victims of vaccine imperialism right now. Illiteracy eradication is number six, African knowledge program number seven, psychological rehabilitation, technology transfer, debt cancellation. So yes, point eight is on point. Colonialism has disfigured us, leaving us in need of psychological rehabilitation. We have to do some of that ourselves, but a, a reparation a plan, which includes health facilities and mental health facilities um, is on the card. So George Lamings in the Castle of My Skin speaks of colonialism, psychic entanglement that is often beyond the understanding of a third generation British citizen of West Indian ancestry, maybe even beyond the third. So the final question I will address raises the issue of how the Canadian economy benefited both from plantation slavery and from the flight of capital from the Caribbean post-slavery, as well as reparations paid to enslavers. The post-slavery relations and benefits through trade and migration are known, I think. But what I really want to focus on is perhaps some of the things that are not so well known. Here on this slide, you see evidence from the compensation records held at the University College of, of, of London of the connection between enslavement in the Caribbean and Canadian enslavers. And this re reinforces the point that Natasha made earlier, that it is complex. It's not only the Caribbean against EU countries and Britain. It's also about the USA and, and Canada. In the case of the USA, if you look at the recent, the updated database, the, the Eltis database on uh, the ships that trafficked Africans to this part of the world, you will see that the USA, there are ships that pull the flag of the United States of America that engage in trafficking directly from Africa to the, to the, to the Caribbean, not just using the Caribbean as a transshipment port to the US, but directly uh, to the Caribbean um, to sell Africans in the Caribbean. So for example, we see Metha Baz Almon, governor at Dalhousie University from 1854 to 1868 and 1869 to 1871, who filed claims for compensation for 23 enslaved people on Mount Salas um, plantation in St. Andrew, Jamaica. And he received 514 pounds along with uh, some co-claimants. Foster Lake Mayor Corps was awarded the largest share of the compensation for Pembroke Estate in Trelawney, Jamaica, 6,114 for 293 enslaved people, with Thomas Fitzgerald as trustee and executor of Frederick Richard Corps, Ida Camp to Canada as Governor General from 1802, I'm not sure to when. Then we have Sir John A. Macdonald, Prime Minister of Canada from 1867 to 1873 and 1878 to 1891, who married his second wife, Susan, daughter of Thomas James Bernard, owner and claimant, claimant of four Jamaican properties, including the beleaguered Bernard Lodge Sugar Plantation in St. Catherine right now, where workers have lost their jobs and the factory has closed. The other claimant was George Parker, owner and claimant of nine properties in Guyana, including Leonora in Demerara, where 402 people were enslaved and he received uh, I think about over 20,000 pounds in compensation because of the number of enslaved Africans and the number of plantations. Then we have Sir Anthony Musgrave, after whom the Musgrave Medals are named in Jamaica, and many of us are lobbying 
for the end of the naming of that medal after this governor. Governor of Jamaica, 1877 to 1883, but governor of British Columbia, 1869 to 71, governor of Newfoundland, and he was the son of Anthony Musgrave, who is associated with three small claims made in Antigua for a total of approximately 260 pounds for 60 enslaved people. And finally, we have Jacob Assimilius Irving II, who got uh, 3834 uh, pounds sterling, and uh, uh, Thirlwall, who was associated with five claims made in St. Vincent, either as owner or executor, totaling approximately 2,257 pounds sterling. Clearly then, some lobbying for redress can be done right here in Canada uh, to build solid, or there in Canada, to build solidarity with the descendants of the extraction of wealth from the Caribbean to develop Canada. So it's not only about migrants, migration now, and um, remittances and, and, uh, and developing communities of Black people in Canada, of course, which I support, like in Halifax, and to build sites of memory to them, but also to join the Caribbean repatriate justice movement. So to conclude, our approach now should be to establish a formal global network of scholars, scholar activists, and civil society organizations that will work on putting together a joint call for repatriate justice, as there is always strength in numbers. We have to form a united front to end racism, racial discrimination, and related intolerance. And you know, Sunday is coming up as a, and it is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And I think now is a good time to reflect on what we can do to implement the International Day or to show um, that we care about this issue on the International Day. Of course, we know it came about because of the Sharpeville massacre in South Africa, but it has global implications. And you know, we have to talk about the failure of European powers to engage a region on the question of reparation because it is an indication of racial discrimination. We have right on our side. I always like to quote Sir Ellis Clark from Trinidad and Tobago, who said this in 1964, an administering power is not entitled to extract for centuries all that can be got out of a colony. And when that has been done to relieve itself of its obligations by the conformment of a formal but meaningless, meaningless because it cannot possibly be supported political independence. Justice requires that reparation be made to the country that has suffered the ravages of colonialism before that country is expected to face up to the problems and difficulties that will inevitably be set it upon independence. I also appeal for us to intensify political action on the ground through decolonizing the visual landscape. In Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago and elsewhere in the region, Status of Cristobal Colon and Queen Victoria are still standing. Happily, Barbados has confined Nelson to a museum artifact. But most of us in the region, we have obviously not actualized our statements that Black Lives Matter, nor engage seriously in the field of memory studies. And the field of memory studies is very important if we're going to build this mass army to seek repatriate justice. As Peter Verov Sek has said, though the content of the politics of memory is rooted in past events, the illocutionary meaning, the desired communicative effect of this discourse is clearly directed and motivated by contemporary politics. We need our tangible sites of memory because they can guide us as we attempt to recover the fragmented, silent, screaming memories of slavery and build support for the 10-point action plan of the CARICOM Reparation Commission, even though I've heard the criticisms. It is not cast in stone. And of course, if we are interested in the movement, we work collectively to refine and implement it. It's our time now to turn the table on the slave drivers of the current era. Bob Marley put it well.
Thank you, Vereen. Thank you so much for taking us through that important um, series of, of points and ending on an, <laughs> it could not have been better said. Um, it's time to turn the tables. I'd like to introduce our third speaker, uh, Sikaya Thomas. Sikaya Thomas was an active participant in the United Nations World Conference Against Racism held in South Africa in 2001. In 2002, Sikaya was a key planner of the African and African Descendant World Conference Against Racism. The Global African Congress, the GAC, was created out of that conference. Sikaya was elected, to, elected its chair in 2002 and has continued in that role. The GAC strives to accomplish its goals of equitable distribution of global resources by demanding reparatory justice, advocating for policies that combat institutional racism, and working to ensure respect for all Africans everywhere. As chair of the GAC, Sakaya developed strategies to link with trade unions, youth, women, farmers, students, and professionals. Now organized in 20 countries, its constitution is considered by many to be a model of Pan-Africanism in the 21st century. Join me in welcoming Sikaya Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, first of all, let me say thanks to everybody who have organized this wonderful event taking complete advantage of a new world than is set out by um, the pandemic. So we are now living a virtual world where we could speak to each other right across the globe from our living room. First of all, um, let me thank the two speakers ahead. And um, Chevy, I, I refer to Chevy as one of the young giants. And Chevy put me in a very spot, bad spot yesterday after sending him my um, submission. He says, no, 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 I, I, I don't want that. I, I want something else. You want me to walk everybody through something that is not well talked about, some obvious gaps. And as both Natasha and Vereen spoke with the excellent presentation, I think I could better appreciate where Chevy is coming from. So I will try to fill in some of the gaps. And first and foremost, <laughs> Natasha, so you're from Antigua. I would like to pay respect to perhaps um, Timekta more than anybody else in the Caribbean. Timekta <clears throat> never failed to remind us of the reparation. I remember as a youngster, um, in Toronto, Tim Hector, Rosie Douglas, and um, Alpha Roberts happened to be sitting in their company, and Walter Rad happened to be sitting in their company. And they were discussing Caribbean independence, and they kept saying, and at the time of independence, they never asked Britain for a penny. Didn't make sense to me at the time. I discovered later on from Tim precisely what he meant by that. And he has continued to be a beacon of hope for me as well. So what I'm going to try to do is to try to share with everybody some of the steps, some of the little baby steps that is not yet written in the history books. And probably very it's a good time to perhaps deposit some of those in some of those material to the reparation center so they can be made available. So let me start off with 
the World Conference Against Racism in 2001. So here in Canada, we found out by accident through some African-American connection that there's gonna be a World Conference Against Racism to be held in South Africa. And that the Canadian government was attending that conference and there were literally no blacks. I'm not exaggerating, literally no black people was selected to go to this conference. So we got a hold of this information through some uh, Caribbean connection in the United States and it mobilized. And it just so happened that the person who were the um, Minister of Multiculturalism was Hedy Fry, a black woman who lives in British Columbia, an MP, and so, we rally and mobilize as much as we can. And we ask that the government provide resources for the NGO to attend. Because representing Canada was people from the multicultural department and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. As I said, they had absolutely no blacks. So we first attend the preparatory conference. Before the World Conference, they have a series of preparatory conference right across various regions of the world, given how the United Nations is organized. So the first conference I attended was in Chile. When I got to Chile, um, I heard a little voice in the background calling and the United States and Britain, how are you going to have a world conference against racism and you won't put reparation on it? And it's a small little voice in the background. And as the NGO, we had to stay in other quarters. That voice was a guy called David Commission. He and I become very good friends since. So the two countries from the Caribbean was David and Jamaica. And when David was pushing, and I'm walking you through these little examples because it will serve notice as to the kind of work that has to be done, still has to be done. And with all of the great things that have been done in the Caribbean, we cannot take our eyes, by, by that I mean, the great work that has been done establishing the Caribbean Rep Reparation Commission and the Research Center. Obviously, milestone, significant achievement. I'm saying this because we cannot take our eyes off the enemy at any time. While we were discussing the stuff, discussing putting reparation on the agenda, the American ambassador to the conference walked in and chuck, physically attack David Commission, physically hit him and pointing his finger in his face and saying, I know what you guys are up to. I know what you guys are up to. I remember talking to some American scholars and they were telling us that Canada, the European and United States always get their way at these, country, at these conferences. So it was customary for them to be doing that. So what we had to do, we had to reach out right across the world, inform as many people as possible about this upcoming conference. Next conference was in Geneva. When we got to Geneva, the crowd was a little larger. We established what was known as African and African Descendant Caucus. When we had the African and African Descendant Caucus, we organized subcommittee. There were subcommittees. One was the drafting committee, one was the lobby committee, and the logistics committee. What we then do was approach individual countries with language that we would like them to put in, would like them to put in what was being negotiated. Because the United Nations process is a simultaneous negotiation between all of the different countries. So you have to be negotiating the language. And many of those countries from Africa, from the Caribbean themselves, in fact, there was only two Caribbean, three Caribbean countries at the time when we went to Geneva in 2000. And one, Cuba, Barbados, and Jamaica. Cuba, Barbados, and Jamaica. Those are three Caribbean countries. Most of the African countries had very little knowledge 
as to what reparation was. The strategy is we had to draft up language and lobby those governments, say these are, what we, these are what we wanted to include in the negotiation. So overnight, there was a success. There was a tremendous amount of success. The greatest contribution came from African Americans. They mobilized tremendously, large contingent, large contingent from Europe. And the success of that mobilization, by the time we reached to Durban, we thought it would be a crime not to continue that process. And so before we leave Durban, before we left Durban, we decided that we will meet the following year and we approached the government of Barbados whether or not they would host another conference. Before we left Durban, there's a couple of victories. One, Mary Robinson was the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, we literally occupied her office, sat in her office on a daily basis and asked her to do a number of things, a number of the demands that came out of the African African Descendant Caucus. One of which we asked her to ensure that at the end of the conference, a prominent structure was established within the United Nations framework to ensure that a group of experts will consider the condition of African and African descendants. She was so impressed by the emotions that she said, if anything, she will ensure that this get done, that she did. That was what was responsible for her removal. She didn't get a second term at the United Nations after the World Conference against racism. So we did that. <clears throat> 2002, we went to Barbados, having had the success of the Durban Declaration of Program of Action, as you know, 168 countries declare that the transatlantic slave trade is a crime against humanity and should have always been so. But there's some very important lessons that I want to draw attention to, particularly because we paying some attention to the gains we've made and the potential for disruption in the future. While we, <clears throat> while we made some tremendous gains between Africa in the diaspora and Africa and the continent, I'm sure Sir Hill Beckles could attest to this particular story. We had the Nigerian government, for example, who was outstanding in representing the African continent. The Ghanaian government too. And just before the final aspects of the conference, none other than Tony Blair <coughs> appeared in South Africa. And I'm sharing these stories and they're all factual. The Nigerian delegate, Nigerian ambassador with whom we have developed very good relationship with all some of us, myself included, to go and meet his foreign minister. And here this big, strong man with tears in his eyes. His foreign minister was ripping him apart, suggesting that he shouldn't have been doing that because Tony Blair showed up at the conference. I think I've seen somewhere where Hillary made some reference how disappointing he was. I think he might have just walked away from one of those meetings because Tony Blair <clears throat> was able to persuade many of the African countries to take out certain critical language that end up in the final version of the Durban Declaration of Program of Action. The words, <clears throat> and it's important <clears throat> that all of us study and understand exactly those words, the language in there. We had to make a compromise. It's important. We have to work with what we have. That's what we gain. But it's not, not what was put on the table. So after 2001, <clears throat> we decided that the we met in South Africa and we decided that we will continue the process. Then came 9-11. Africans in America just totally disappeared. <clears throat> Thousands of contacts we had. We don't, I can't explain what happened. All of this brilliant, magnificent organizer, champion for reparation, could no longer be seen or be heard from. Very few we could have still get in touch with them. What we did in Canada, <clears throat> we started a series of 
reparation lectures at the Jamaican Canadian Association. So between 2001 and 2002, we had a tremendous amount of public engagement, calling on the best expert, most knowledgeable people around the world and the reparation, to anchor the reparation inside of the black community. When we get to Barbados, we looked at the Durban Declaration and Program of Action and decided how are we gonna translate, <coughs> excuse me, how are we gonna translate what's in the Durban Declaration and Program of Action to a daily campaign primarily to raise consciousness education and what it means in terms of the larger reparation agenda, what it means in terms of <coughs> the gap in develop economic development, social development, what it meant in terms of repair, what it meant in terms of spirituality. So after Barbados, we got to the drawing board and we decided what part of the world would be a quick win for reparation. So the few African-Americans, people from the Caribbean reparation, activists and those that we have, we sat and we put our collective mind together, what would be the quick win for reparations? And we decided that the quick win would be the Caribbean. What we started to do, we started what I call a letter writing campaign. And we have written to every single heads of state in the Caribbean. So the interesting worrying that a table that you use but slave owners were compensated. We use that same table and we write every single head of state and we said, this is what the slave owner in your country was paid. So we identify every single country. Somebody mentioned King Class. I was able to use King Class words and said to the Antiguan government, this is what a former enslaved said. We're able to use Buster words and said the government of Barbados, this is what they said. And we did, we did that right across the Caribbean. Jamaica is a very interesting case. We have Professor Barish Evans, who, whom I had known fairly well. One of the strategies we employ, each government, heads of state that we write, we make sure that we know somebody who knows somebody in government. That's one strategy. Second strategy, we make sure that the people at the grassroots level, whilst we send a letter to the heads of state, the people at the grassroots level would get a copy of the letter and could knock on the prime minister, the minister of foreign affairs board. I want to highlight the work that Professor Barry Chevrons did for some reason, he knew whoever the Jamaican foreign minister was at the time. I don't remember who he is, but he knew him. And he was able to hand him his letter and said, here we go. And Breen, I remember him writing me once and said he has spoken to the Jamaican prime minister, PJ Patterson. And as of now, I should stop writing him because he was tired of getting my letter and I should start writing to you. Yes, at that time, the Jamaican government was about to establish the reparation commission. So I'm giving these examples because the question was asked, what kind of a strategy, what can we do that can work effectively? So I'm going through these minor details because it has not yet been written in the history books. So these are strategies that we use that have brought us some results. Now, while we continue to write the letters, I remember in 2000, and five, we started a campaign that the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade in the British Empire was 2007. And when I wrote to each of those governments, I won't name the country, two of them wrote back at the Prime Minister level and said, thank you for telling me, we forgot. Thank you for telling us they didn't remember. And the country that responded most favorable was the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
Ralph Gonzalez. When we asked Ralph to take the issue to the United Nations, he said, done. And he did a fine job. Then 2003, in Barbados in 2002, we decided as a strategy to pursue Caribbean reparation, we must first identify the case of E.T. We must just identify E.T. as the case where we throw all of our support, all of our resources, to ensure that reparation becomes a reality. At the time, Aristide was president of E.T. I could tell you that a few of us from here and from the Caribbean went to E.T. where they, have, they were having a conference, and when we got there, we were like rock stars. The people were so excited. A year later, Aristide was kidnapped and thrown out of office. What we had to do to respond as time went by, we discovered that Canada, the United States, and France were the primary architect, mover, and shaker to overthrow Aristide. And in fact, the meeting that was organized to overthrow Aristide took place in Ottawa, where none other than Colin Powell, the Canadian foreign minister, and the US and um, the France foreign minister participate in that conference. And what we did in the Global African Congress to again generate some public awareness not only we went on a letter writing campaign, but we also ambitiously decided that we're gonna organize a campaign to boycott France wine in Canada. We have had some success, success in the sense that we were able to pick it a couple of L, a local um, wine store across Ontario and raise some public awareness around the reparations. I want to share with you Another critical experience in this process, why we decided that as an NGO, we must focus on government to get the job done. A few of us were literally playing around, literally. And we had just read where the Church of England owned slaves or enslaved some of our ancestors in Barbados. And we went to the University of Toronto. We tried to get some data from the, United, from the University of Toronto. What does it cost to operate the university on a yearly basis? What it costs to build, to actually do the structural building? We didn't get that information, but we were able to obtain some information on the cost to operate the university. We wrote the Archbishop of Canterbury, we said, your church enslaved our people in Barbados, and we want you to pay reparation. This is what we want you to do. We literally conceived of different faculties, many, many faculties. And to be honest, we were joking because we didn't think they were going to do it. We designed the faculty, medicine, engineer, agronomist, all of the faculties you could think of said we want you to sponsor, I don't remember the numbers now, X number of students, they must be drawn from the diaspora as well as they should be drawn from Africa. We need you to operate the school for 125 years. The Archbishop of Canterbury wrote back and said, with whom I negotiate. At that point, we were absolutely convinced that reparation is possible. We turn over that information immediately to Paracom as many Caribbean government that would listen to us and would press the case for reparation. Once again, I must say Ralph Gonzalez stepped up to do it. So I'm citing these little examples. It's, it might be boring, but I'm citing these examples to say that civil society have a critical role to play. And in spite of the skeptics, criticism, from your friends and colleagues who ask you during these early days, if you have nothing better to do with your time, 
The answer is no. We didn't have anything better to do than to engage in this reparation campaign. In 2013, we are drafting up what does this reparation commission would look like? What does this reparation commission would look like? And we did our best. And we lobbied a few other government. And we didn't think that that draft strategic plan was completed, but it was good enough for Ralph Gonzalez. He took it to the Caribbean heads of state in 2013. It was a blessed day when he called and said the job was done. And he advised us that is not exactly what we was asking for, but this is the best he could do because there's some government we're not here as yet. So again, while we have made the gains, the Harcum Reparation Commission, and the Center for Research, we cannot take our eyes off the prize. Those institutions could be very vulnerable because not all of our leaders are there yet. Notwithstanding the fantastic job Sir Hillary and Vereen and a number of other people are doing, notwithstanding the fantastic job that many of the National Reparation Commissions are doing, we also know that there's tremendous amount of pressure from government like the government of the United Kingdom that it's no secret that the British government are using the diplomat in the Caribbean to lobby various government to leave the commission. I know Vereen can't say it, and I don't want to put Vereen to say it, but I will say it. The British government today <clears throat> they continue to put pressure on member states in, in CARICOM to leave the CARICOM Reparation Commission. So my brothers and sisters, let's not take our eyes off a dose price. Let's not take our, our feet off the gas. The work still has to be done. So while we embark on the writing campaign to the Church of England, to the Catholic Church, many of the financial institutions, and we try and make the case as much as we can, we also continue to lobby the Canadian government, the federal government, the provincial government. And while they continue to resist, we continue to work in other areas. For example, in the Ontario Public Service, we decided to form an organization called the Black Ontario Public Service Network. And using the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, we know that the Canadian government is a signature for what needs to be done. We were able to take out specific aspects of that Lobby the government that you are responsible for this because this is international law. And I can say to you one of the small victory we have had, though we think it's a small victory, we're not there yet. Recently, I discovered that the Ontario government is the only government in the world where we have anti-racism legislation. The Ontario government is the only government in the world where we have an anti-racism directorate and I've had an anti-racism policy. I can say to you that the policy is weak. We continue to push for greater policy, but with determination and a vision, using the Durban Declaration and Program of Action because they signed onto that. And while we continue to do that, we must continue to make link with the institution that already established for reparation. What do I mean by that? For example, most of us would have known Professor George Day at the University of Toronto doing some fantastic work. Professor Day is looking at projects like decolonization of the educational system. Recently in a discussion I, with him, I said to him, have you shared your work with the Caracom Reparation Research Center? He said, no. We, I had not thought of that. We were able to make that link 
to say to Professor Day, we want you to submit as much as you can because that's precisely the kind of work the Caribbean, Caribbean Reparation Center is doing. So I'm citing these examples to say these are small steps, these are baby steps we can take and we should take to ensure that reparation becomes a reality. We need to look very care, uh, carefully what the European countries did in terms of development in countries like Australia, New Zealand, the white countries, and Canada, and what they did not do in the Caribbean. Think of the extraction of wealth that came out of the Caribbean. And yes, I've heard mention made of Caribbean countries' investment in Canada. I was in Trinidad recently, and I was looking at some of Eric Williams' notes in the library, and I saw a direct connection between a plantation in St. Kitts and the Canadian Railway. So those are direct research that can be done to hold Canada responsible for enslavement of African in this country, as well as the benefits from the Caribbean. I noticed there's a chat from Chevy that I should wrap up, so I, I am going to wrap up, but I'd be very happy to answer any question regarding some of the work we did at the grassroots level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakaya. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of important work there that that we need to take note of. And um, I'd like to introduce our discussant for today, uh, Chevy Eugene. Chevy is a doctoral candidate in the social and political thought program at York University. He's completing his dissertation titled Caribbean Reparations, a Radical Creative Imagination Approach. This is the first dissertation length study of the creative arts as a key instrument in the advocacy for Caribbean reparations for transatlantic slavery and the genocide of the Caribbean's indigenous populations. Chevy Eugene's research foci are the political economy of reparations in the Caribbean, the role of arts and culture in the development of small state economies, and the decolonial praxis in international human rights law. Chevy. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Sulak, for allowing me to be part of this important and timely conversation on reparations for transatlantic slavery and the genocide of the Caribbean indigenous population. I would also like to thank the panelists, Dr. Natasha Lightfoot, Professor Vernon Shepard, um, and Mr. Sakaya Thomas for <clears throat> the informative and engaging presentation. As expressed by the panelists in various capacities, Caribbean governments, academics, and grassroots organizations in the region and the diaspora have put evidence and action components in place to establish a moral, ethical, and legal case for restitution from the former colonial government for transatlantic slavery. The reparation argument is more than physical or psychological. It is, about the, it is about acknowledging that the immiserating poverty and economic importance in the contemporary Caribbean can be traced to the slave trade and enslavement. Due to transatlantic slavery being a state institutional, institutional system which involved European nations and the national institutions like the Church of England, merchant houses, banks and insurance agencies, it has been argued by reparation theories that the claim for repatriate justice must be made from one government to the, uh, to the other. By this, I mean, from the colonized to the colonizer. In Natasha's light food presentation, she addressed the political environment that informed the Caribbean Reparation Commission, which was not limited primarily to the critical text, Britain Black Dead, Reparation for Slavery and Native Genocide by the eminent historian Henry Beckles in 2013, but also the politically charged context of the late 2000s. Two particular cases she will highlight it. One significant factor, she argued, was the 200, 200, 200 anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade, where Britain overly celebrated themselves in re relinquishing the trade which they established. However, in response, activists took to the streets to underscore that British anti-Blackness did not topple with the slave trade, but like capitalism, it continued to redefine itself in contemporary society. The second is the 2008 financial bailout of cooperation by the Western government, 
This reflected the 1834-38 slavery bailout, which was given to slave owners for the loss of their property, and I put that in quotes, post-emancipation. While the former enslaved did not receive rec recompense, but rather an extra four years of free labor to their former masters. This in turn further moved Caribbean thinkers to question the global North, North's continuous negligence of redress for black life. This act informed CARICOM's institutionalization of the reparation movement. Professor Vernon Shepard encouraged us to think differently concerning the long genealogy of reparation movements in the Caribbean. As the title of this particular Baptist lecture is called, open quote, the Caribbean case for reparation, remembrance, reclamation, and restorative futures, close quote. Shepard proposes a continuation of the activities of the enslaved people, which include protest actions such as non cooperation as repatriate justice strategies to reclaim their rights and dignity as human beings. And even when, I, when we talk about human beings or persons, we could also think about Fanon concept of the, Franz Fanon concept of the, of the new human and Sylvia Winter's um, genres of man and how we construct and rethink, how we unpack, how we deconstruct and reimagine what it means to be human, right? Moving on. Moreover, the forms of resistance that have historically taken place through the indigenous protests create a chain that connects the various tactics of repatriate justice in Caribbean today. Shepard alludes to the role of civil society in putting pressure on Caribbean government to rethink the economic relations with Western governments and international financial institutions such as IMF and the World Bank, when we think about it as a, case, like, as a few examples. Rather than seeking out loans from the former colonial powers, CARICOM should stress that a fundamental reason for the existence of present economic crisis is the current neo-colonial relations, which is part of the legacy of transatlantic slavery. Shepard recommends, Shepard recommends a way to move forward is to foster close working relationships between grassroots movements and the main reparation actors in the advocacy for reparation. As such, this leads to Sakaya Thomas' presentation on the critical role of grassroots movement and civil society in the global reparations discourse. As highlighted, the Global African Congress has been compu a compulsory voice in the advocacy and transnational dialogues on the reparation movement. The initiative has not only pushed for Caribbean reparations while working across the region, but it has mobilized people and organizations in the Caribbean diaspora. Chapters have been formed, as Sakai alluded to earlier on, in Toronto, Halifax, London, England, and the United States. Sorry, I believe Professor Johnson highlighted that, to name a few. The group was also one of the vital voices that stood against the US and the French government when they kidnapped former president of Haiti, Jabatid Aristide, after his call for reparation from France. From France. Additionally, through GAC's lobbying, they played a central role in the establishment of the International Decade for People of African Descent, which is themed recognition, justice, and development. So I'm highlighting this to show and building off what the, the presenters, the panelists highlighted, the important role of civil society in pushing the reparation movement, right? So in moving forward, I'd like to draw on one of the common themes from the panel, like I just mentioned, the importance of civil society in the, in the movement, right? As such, and I'm and, and just going back, looking at um, Professor Lightfoot's presentation, when she meant, she, she, she talked about the two, two critical cases, one of them, two critical cases that, that push, that intensify or disrupt Europe, um, Britain society, in the 2000, right? The first in the 2000, the first one was um, the social activism that took place after the after Britain was celebrating its 200 year anniversary of the slave trade. So it shows you the role, the important role that civil society has in the reparation discourse, right? As such, I believe the reparation campaign should be a people led movement. That is, everyday people must be at the forefront of the initiative and be central in its decision making processes. However, it is safe to make the claim that one drawback in, one, in our current context is that majority of Caribbean people do not know about the reparation movement, or if they are aware, they do not know what it entails. As such, my contribution to the conversation reparation comes in the form of the app as a political tool to mobilize civil society, more specifically young people. Young people in the Caribbean add to the continuance of creating and maintaining cultural vibrancy of, of Caribbean member states. Professor Lightwood mentioned the Life in the Legacy movement as an example of young people being at the forefront, right? Using platforms, using, using contemporary technologies such as social media to push particular political messages around sexual violence, right? For example, with the Life in the Legend uh, movement. According to Beckles, Rastafari has been the main group that has been consistent in the reparation movement by engaging youth primarily through reggae music. 
And thank you, Professor Shepard, for playing that song, Slave Driver. I was busting shots in the air, side note, but I digress. Um, Rastafari has established a template in engaging youth to culture, but various expressions of the arts, such as spoken word, theater, creative writing, and visual arts, to name a few, to name a few, can be conceptualized and expressed around themes of reparation to politicize the general populace, particularly the marginalized on issues of reparation. In conclusion, a mass education campaign on reparation is an important step that should be taken in partnership with reparation scholars, activists, and educators to politicize civil society and the significance of the movement. In thinking about reparation education, in thinking about the reparation educational campaign, the creative arts can be used as an engaging tool to inform the general populace on the campaign and its benefits. This can, lead, this can then lead us to ask questions ourselves. What is the divide between government-driven lobby, academic lobby, and civil society? And why are there tensions? And also, lastly, how can the reparation discourse continue the decolonization project in the Caribbean rather than continue imperial and neocolonial relations? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chevy. Thank you for that summary and um, pulling together the arguments that were put out by our by our guests today. I know that we are way over time, but I would be remiss if I didn't address some of the questions that our folks have written in the chat. So I'm going to crave your indulgence and address each of the panelists specifically with a question so that we, we can keep um, crave your indulgence for 10 minutes. Um, the first question I'd like to pull out comes from Marlon Rosas. And Marlon was asked the question about uh, some of the, the issues that have been raised by the reparations movement are so broad, are so big, are going to take so long. And the, her question is, or their question is, why not focus, and I'm going to ask Natasha to, to, to answer this one, why not focus on the cash payments as a universal demand? Why not make that the central issue for the reparations movement right now to get that done while the other things will come at a later date. I hope I paraphrase properly, Marlon. Uh, Natasha, if you may, please. So I, I guess the immediate answer for me that comes to mind is this question of who sets the definition of um, who is included in the community to be given direct cash payments? How do we define all who has been touched by the anti-Blackness, the um, the impoverishment, the continued legacies of enslavement. And I would hesitate um, to, to just allow for immediate cash payments to a set of people who might have real trouble determining how to even prove themselves as descendants of enslaved uh, people because of the again the history of colonialism being what it is record keeping in the um in the former colonial caribbean for one is difficult the same way um in the u.s south i'm i don't know i can't speak to canada but i just assume that it might be difficult as well how easy is it to be able to trace um to without a shadow of a doubt who you are and how exactly you descend from enslaved people um at the moment i can't I just know that my mother's family descends from enslavement to the current time in between two islands, Antigua and Barbuda. And my father's family, four islands, Antigua, Barbados, um, Dominica, and Montserrat. And so there's all of this documentation that I would have to somehow gather from these different colonial archives in and we know about things like hurricanes, natural disasters that have left archives themselves on these islands ravaged, right? That, setting that aside, um, the issue of documentation, I also would wonder about the issue of, again, of definition, simply because I also think about myself as, again, I was born into a community of immigrants in um, New York. And ultimately, I would say, when I asserted in my, in my talk just now, the idea that um, someone like me or my Canadian cousins deserves reparations from multiple governments, I, I mean that 
not just because of their role in past crimes, but also in ongoing crimes against Black people to right now. And I, I feel like any Black person that enters into these very violent states and the ways that they treat all of their resident Black members of these societies is one that means that we all deserve some form of redress. I don't know how I would, for instance, say that someone like the, the mother of Amadou Diallo, because she's a recent African immigrant to the Bronx, doesn't deserve reparations, because there's a legacy of anti-Blackness that comes out of slavery, that comes out of the history of policing in the United States, that leads to me saying, she is due reparatory justice for how her child was killed dead in the street. And I bring that up as one of the moments of radicalizing a, a grassroots Black activism around police violence right now in New York and the you know kind of wider question of what police violence in America and how that relates in particular to reparatory justice. If we think about the history of policing as a colonial institution that came out of how to ultimately track down um, fugitive and slave people, right? And that's true, again, up and down this hemisphere. I don't really know how we separate those things out. I don't really know if cash payments takes care of all of the different ways that Black people of different origins have been met with um, persistent forms of inequity. Uh, so I, I believe that's why I feel like structural uh, redress is important, that Black people have greater access to structures. And maybe it's not necessarily that one can happen without the other. Maybe the, it, the issue is a both end because Black people are due payments too, that it would be great for them to have money immediately to be able to um, immediately raise their standards of living. But I still feel like being able to address the broader issues of, of health, of housing, of technology, especially now in this time of remote everything, um, the access to the unequal access that, that especially people in um, impoverished communities of color have to Wi-Fi and devices and things like that. All of that to me speaks to very entangled legacies of ongoing theft against Black people, against Indigenous people. It, it's just, for me, I feel like the structures that we are talking about, um, they have to be, there, there has to be some sort of um, allow, allowance really set aside for how they have profited from anti-Blackness and how they will repair it. And how will Black people access that repair through said structures, what will those, what will these different institutions do to improve lives that so far they've been contributing to their dispossession? That's, I think, I appreciate the question. I really do because I think it's still such a complicated one. Um, and I don't, I definitely don't think it's invalid, but I just, I get worried about how we count who counts for the cash payment if we just make it cash payment. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Natasha, for that. Um, uh, Vereen, there is a question that was in the chat directed for you. Well, first of all, there was a shout out for you. Let me make sure I, I do that. It was from Tanya saying, hail to you, uh, my lifelong teacher. So there you go, Vereen. But the question that is coming from Miguel Gonzalez is uh, to ask you to, to, to uh, look at the language and demands for reparation around the rights of indigenous peoples. Miguel is asking, uh, particularly around the UN 2007 declaration and the American Dec Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, is there potential for a connection here? Well, I, I, I don't think we separate the demands of indigenous people from the demands of the rest of people in the Caribbean. Uh, it's the second point on the 10 point action plan, repair for indigenous communities. So it's, it's completely a part of what we do. And uh, we at the Center for Reparation Research 
have been going around the, the region. But we can't go physically now. We did start in Guyana. We did go to Antigua, Barbuda. We did go to a couple of other uh, countries. We're doing it um, through webinars now. And one of the, the, the school's lectures we had was precisely on indigenous people involving speakers from Belize, uh, St. Vincent of the Grenadines, Dominica, uh, and, and many other countries, and from the United States of America, from uh, Canada, because we see this as a joined up movement, not something, I don't think we can geographically separate the movement into neat compartments like that. But we do have to teach the history of the Caribbean and as a way of, I suppose, um, and getting everyone to understand the justification for the movement. And I must say, because I'm a UN expert as well, I'm a member of the, I'm a vice chair of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The indigenous expert on the committee makes sure that every time a state party comes before the CERD, that questions are raised about the treatment of indigenous peoples. So it's completely within um, the mandate. It's, 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 it's within our radar. And um, it's just that a lot of people don't understand that genocide, when we use the term genocide, it doesn't mean that every single person was killed. Um, and so there's a surprise that really they are indigenous people, but we were taught that they, were, they all died out. So a lot of education has to go on as well. And celebration of the important days of indigenous peoples so that this awareness um, can be uh, there. But and I have to say thank you for the shout out. I think I did see it in the chat, so that's great. Thank you so much. I need to say though, um, I was smiling when Sikaya said that maybe I won't admit something or the other. Um, I would encourage you to go and have some discussion with the UK diplomats in the Caribbean. Um, they would ask you, where, where do you get this impression that um, Shepard afraid of anybody. <laughs> so um, I'm just thinking about the endless meetings I've had with UK diplomats, some of whom have actually asked to come and see the National Council on Reparation to have dialogue and to hear what are our concerns and, uh, and so on. And in 2007, Jamaica took the lead, in fact, in ensuring that we destabilize the myth of, to, of, of abolition. And I mentioned that in the in, in my short presentation uh, today. Um, I do admit, Chevy, that um, the awareness raising must be intensified. It must continue. But young people have not been ignored in the struggle. Um, we have had the school's lecture series going on since last year. It will end in August. And um, it's the center in collaboration with all national committees uh, who mobilize and students for, for this lecture. And also we had the successful youth run for reparation right through the region. So we are operating on all fronts, but of course, and as I said in my conclusion, the joined up approach is critical. We need everyone um, on deck. And um, I sympathize with the issue of financial compensation and that's why we're not going that route in, in, in that way because we believe that everyone in the region was disfigured by colonialism. Every society needs repair. And so uh, uh, and the, the, the British did give some countries a package for their independence, which is why we, Hillary Beckles has been talking about the Colombo plan. So we have to realize that our leaders were lobbying as well, saying that you can't, as Eric Williams said, you can't just suck the region dry and then you, you disappear. And Sir Ellis Clark also said that. So um, we are saying we need more schools, we need hospitals, we need so much social infrastructure, we need debt write-off, we need info, you know, all, all kinds of, um, we, have the, we have the right to development, we use the right to development strategy as well. So. It's a, it's a multifaceted strategy to ensure the region benefits. But to be honest with you, I have no problem if the 47 million is given back in cash as a first installment. 
so that people can get money in their hands. I have no problem with that. We shouldn't be afraid of money. And, and there have been attempts to, we can't quantify the pain and suffering and all of that. But I must say that a, a group of actuaries, bankers, economic historians did meet in the UK, in London uh, some years ago to say, if we should quantify what, what would be the elements of this, you know? And finally, I'm, 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 I apologize for this, but Sikaya, I so, I'm so happy that you went through the, the, the Durban process. Um, I knew you were going to be on and I knew you would do that. But I had a slide, which I think I'm gonna read now, which I didn't put up. We always use the DDPA as a justification for the repatriate justice struggle based on the history. And we always use this part of the DDPA. Historical injustices have undeniably contributed to the poverty, underdevelopment, marginalization, social exclusion, economic disparities, instability, and insecurity that affect many people in different parts of the world, in particular in developing countries. So we use this um, always as part of that justification. And at the third, every country is asked about the DDPA and how they are implementing the DDPA and the Decade for People of African Descent, every single one. Okay, thank you so much, Vereen. Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask the last question to, um, to Sikaya coming from, well, I'm creating a question out of what Kingsley Gilliam has written in the chat, in the questions. He makes mention of the work through the Jamaican Canadian Association hosting rep reparation series of lectures. So if you could briefly tell us, Sikaya, about some of the ongoing grassroots work going on right now in the Canadian context, um, I think that would be a great way for us to end this discussion. <clears throat> But to be honest, the, the grassroots work is not as intensified now as it was in the earlier stages. Um, but we need to get back to that. I think what the approach we've taken is that there has been a gradual approach. So there's been a lot of improvement. Um, with the establishment of the Caracom Reparation Commission, we spent a lot of time educating people on the 10 points program and the importance of it, what it means. We also spent a lot of time looking at what reparation would look like. So that's actually your question whether it should be a cash payment. Uh, Vereen said it should be a cash payment and anything else. We see it as technological transfer. We see it as building museum. We see it as um, um, decolonization of the educational uh, uh, process. We see, for example, the return of historical artifacts um, that European countries have stole from continental Africa. We see it where, um, uh, some of our ancestors uh, were wrongly convicted. Um, we see them turning over many of that information and building museum so the issue could be rectified. Uh, so there's a whole host of things that reparation would look like, can look like. Uh, so all of that, we, we get engaged in looking at an educational uh, campaign. What should it look like? Now, we also know in recent time that there has been a lot of debate in Canada, for example, who are entitled to reparation. And we said that as long as you're a black person, as long as you're people of African descent, that we need to look at how structural institutionalized racism was built. And the genesis of anti-black racism came out of the slave trade. Anti-black racism was created to justify enslavement because you know, how are you going to justify that level of crime? So they had to justify a theory and therefore they created scientific racism and the lingering effect of scientific racism and every person that live in countries like this, even countries like the Caribbean we see. So to that extent, we are still engaging in that kind of work. We, um, we, we need to get back to uh, more grassroots work We'd focus a lot on the government, what they could do, both the federal and provincial government. And I use the example, for example, of pushing the anterior government in building museum, passing legislation to address uh, issues around healthcare, uh, um, especially youth dropout, the percentage of black male going into prison system, 
the crisis in this country that gets ignored. Um, um, and it's a very, very serious one in terms of what happened to young uh, black guys. They, they, young black boys, they, they, they are forgotten. A lot of work needs to be done. So we spend a lot of time lighting, lobbying government from inside and outside. So yes, we, we have continued that, that, that work, but not at the level at which we were active in the earlier period. You know, but we we'll get back to some of that work, yes. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sakaya. No, I I want us to bring our, our discussion today to a close, but before I do that, I want to let people know because there was a comment in the chat about um, talking about Latin America and to expand this discussion. Well, this is part one of our discussion about reparations. And in two weeks time on March 31st, at 5 p.m., one hour earlier at 5 p.m., we're going to be expanding this discussion. We're going to be talking to Esther Ohulari coming out of Colombia. We're going to be talking to Clicio Santana, Bahia, Brazil. Uh, Amy Strecker, University of College of Dublin, who will be addressing the question of indigeneity in particular. And Nora Whitman, author of Slavery Reparations, Time is now. So join us on the 31st of March at five o'clock, uh, same place, same time, uh, well, not same time, same place, earlier time for a continuation of this discussion. Let me stop by thanking everyone who participated today. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Natasha Lightfoot, Dr. Vereen Shepherd, Sakaya Thomas, Chevy Eugene for your contributions today. I'd like to thank Shamet Hepburn for her introduction to our topic today. I'd like to thank the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies for their support, Departments of Sociology, Anthropology and Politics. I'd like to thank Gabrielle Hemmings for her help, Krista Jensen, Kafia Abdul Kadir, don't kill me, Kafia, if I don't say it right, uh, Ka Camilla uh, Boniface, Daniel Robinson. But I'd also like to thank the Baptista Committee for pulling this together, uh, Miguel Gonzalez, Julian Gutierrez, Honor Ford Smith, and Chevy Eugene. Thank you all for your participation today. Please take care, walk good, and we will see you on the 31st of March at five o'clock. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.